My name is Lamir Mandelato and I am one of the local organizers. Uh, before starting with the first lecture, I would like to give you some uh, information about the summer school. So, probably as uh, you know, the Machine Learning Summer School is a series of events that uh, has at its, its main goal promoting modern methods of machine learning. Traditionally, there's been a lack of uh, machine learning methods uh, taught at universities, and the goal of the Machine Learning Summer School is precisely to somehow uh, alleviate this, goal, this uh, lack. Uh, traditionally, in the Machine Learning Summer School, we have uh, very well known speakers that are somehow leading uh, the field and pushing the field forward that uh, speak with enthusiasm about different topics related to machine learning. So uh, this is very nice for uh, students and researchers that are eager to learn about uh, machine learning. The machine learning summer school has been very successful over the years. In the beginning, in the beginning they started as an annual event and since 2003 we have had uh, two events per year and since 2011 we have, we have had three events per year. This uh, edition has also been very successful. In particular, we have received more than 500 applications and each uh, application request has been carefully uh, analyzed by the all reviewers, taking into consideration the publications of each applicant, the CV, uh, the cover letter, the foundation letter, and uh, also the poster presentation. So in the end, we, uh, we end up uh, accepting about uh, 150 applicants, including not only PhD students, but also researchers, uh, uh, postdocs, and uh, also faculty staff from more than 30 different countries. So we are very proud to announce an outstanding set of 14 different speakers that uh, will cover a wide uh, variety of topics, uh, from uh, optimization to deep learning, kernel methods, Gaussian inference, reinforcement learning, Gaussian processes, uh, GANs, and so on. So the schedule of the Machine Learning Summer School is displayed on the web page of the event. Uh, I'm going to very briefly give you a few details about it. Essentially, uh, each day is going to be divided into morning sessions and afternoon sessions. In the morning session, uh, we will have two talks. Uh, the first talk will start at 9.30 and, and uh, at 11 we will have a coffee break. The coffee break is going to take place in the cafeteria, which is located on the right hand side of the uh, Polytechnic School. Uh, after the second talk, we will have a break for lunch uh, of uh, 1.5 hours. You have uh, some information on the work of the on the web page of the Machine Learning Summer School about where to have lunch. You may have lunch here at the Polytechnic School, but you are also free to have lunch at other uh, different cafeterias that we have in the uh, university. You have further information about this on the web page of the Machine Learning Summer School. Uh, in the afternoon sessions, we will have two talks again, uh, separated by a coffee break of uh, 30 minutes. We also have some social events and. Uh, to post the presentations that I'm going to describe next. So about the social events, we have scheduled three, um, three activities. The first one is going to take place this uh, Wednesday. It's going to be a guided tour through downtown Madrid that will start at uh, 7.30. You can find information on the web page about this event. Uh, on Saturday, we will have a, a scheduled trip to the city of Segovia, which is located in the north of <coughs> Madrid, and hopefully we will be able to uh, spend the whole day there. And finally, uh, next Wednesday we will have a, a dinner at the Fabula Way and Champagne Terrace in downtown Madrid. Uh, for all these events, you have further information on the web page of the Machine Learning Summer School. Although not directly scheduled as a social event, but it is also kind of famous for tapas, so you are. Uh, uh, somehow welcome to enjoy tapas in Madrid. Atapa is a small piece of food that typically you will get for free when ordering a drink in a bar. And then in the web page of the summer school you have all the information about where to have tapas in Madrid. So uh, besides this we have scheduled two poster sessions in the machine learning summer school. The first one is going to take place this Thursday and the second one will take place next Tuesday. We have more than 100 posters, with more than 50 posters on each session. 
You can find the information about the poster session, sessions on the web page of the Machine Learning Summer School. Please take a look at it. And I would like to point out that the poster size should be a zero and all posters should be printed in portrait format. We will provide a tent to stick the posters to the display panels. So, uh, if you want to have access to the internet during the summer school, if you have uh, access to the URM network, then you should already be able to have access to the internet. I mean, if you have access to the URM in your home institution. Uh, this network is available at the whole campus of Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. If you don't have access to this network in your home institution, then you may use a dedicated network that we have uh, set up for the summer school. This is the information uh, that you will need to connect to this network. It's also provided in a, uh, in a, a sheet of paper that you have received during registration. This network is, however, only available at the Escuela Politecnica Superior. And uh, finally, I would like to thank all our sponsors, uh, the sponsors of the Summer School. Their support has been very valuable uh, for uh, carrying out this event and uh, also for providing some travel support for uh, some of the students attending the event. Thank you very much. So this is everything I have to say, and now I will give the floor to my brother, Jose Miguel Hernández which is another organizer and is going to introduce the present speaker. Good. Uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Shakir Mohamed, who's going to be the first speaker of the summer school. Uh, he's a very well-known researcher in machine learning, he did his PhD in machine learning at Cambridge uh, with Sylvie Karamani. Then he did a postdoc with uh, Nando, I think, at the University of uh, British Columbia. And uh, he was uh, one of the first uh, people that joined uh, DeepMind, I think, before it was acquired by Google. And now he's a research scientist uh, at Google uh, DeepMind. Uh, give a, a big applause uh, to Shakir. Thank you. 
gained by doing experiments, by gaining experience, looking at causality, how we make predictions. And with these two pieces of knowledge, we can then build more complicated sets of reasoning. We can think about what it means to planning. We can look at explanations of hypotheses and events that happen in the world. We can think about what it means to learn rapidly about objects and how they are related in the world. And ultimately, we will come to the point where we think about applications of how these things fit together. Those assistive technologies that we want to build, how we will advance science in some way to create the new generation of healthcare technology, of climate, of energy, uh, fairness, of autonomous systems in various ways. So we will all be, and as you begin your career pathway, will navigate this hierarchy in different ways. You will start at a different point and you will access each of these things in different ways. So to sort of just start, since you've been here, I thought we could just take two minutes where each of you think about where in this hierarchy you find yourself starting at. Some of you will start at application, some of you will start at the bottom of probability theory. And introduce yourself to your neighbors, to the person to the left, to the right, say hello and tell that person where it is in this hierarchy that you're in. So say hello to each other. I'll say hello. So if you 
come out of this one and a half hours or one hour and slightly less, um, that would be good. So I just wanted to have the language to think about the philosophy of machine learning. This lecture is going to be a lot about the principles, the frameworks that we think about in those languages of philosophy and various kinds of things and how we stitch them across different areas of computational science, not just maybe one narrow view of machine learning. Um, then the most important one that I really emphasize whenever I speak is for everyone to understand the model inference algorithm paradigm. And we're going to sort of unpack that with a very different framework so that you can then think about machine learning within this framework and then how that framework helps you understand papers in every other area of computational science, whether that's neuroscience or physics or economics. And then finally, the last one is to sort of use probabilistic thinking in all areas of machine learning to see how it's used in supervised learning and unsupervised learning and in reinforcement learning. And we'll try and touch a little bit on all three of these things. So these are the three things um, that we're going to look at during this time. Um, so any point of thinking about the principle of the probabilistic thinking must itself begin by asking the question of what is the probability? Um, so I don't know if there's someone who's brave or who wants to shout out a definition for probability. Is there anyone that wants to throw out what they think is a definition for probability? Anyone? The first thing that comes to your mind. It is? A measure. A measure. Okay, yes. Um, this is the component of a definition for uh, probability, yes. The likelihood of something happening, we're going to talk about this, the, the sort of precision of this explanation later on. Other people, yes? <coughs> so how frequently an event happens over the set of all possible events. Is there another definition for probability right at the back? Measuring uncertainty. Measuring uncertainty, absolutely. Anyone else? One other view maybe? And an expression of a belief. There's one more that uh, hasn't appeared quite yet. Is there anyone else that has that thought? Yes? The repeated experiments and the number of times you get outcomes. Um, okay, so let's let's just unpack those definitions. They are the last time I read some of books, there were there are at least six to eight definitions of probability, but I'm gonna just use four the four that came up in this room uh, right now. So the one that was mentioned by two people here who knew was this definition of statistical probability. That probability is about the frequency ratio of items or of events occurring in the world. A second definition, this is the one you didn't mention though, is about what is called logical probability. It is the degree of confirmation of a hypothesis based on logical analysis. Right? The rules of logic are the most foundational thing we have, but the rules of logic are not enough for us to do reasoning in the real world. So we need to move beyond the rules of logic, and this is where probability theory, the extension of logic to things that have uncertainty is then the sort of logical probability framework. Um, the other one that didn't come up was probability as propensity. And what you will do as we are reading, you will find this propensity theory of probability. And this is around that probability is useful only because it is for predictions. And machine learning is all about predictions, so we do like this not quite a bit, but it's um, a limited view of probability. And then the one that I mentioned here is about subjective probability. Probability as a degree of belief. So all of these, each definition has sort of a, a limitation, sort of a problem that will create a conundrum that won't be solved. Um, and the point of this one, I guess, is just to say that probability is sufficient for the task of reasoning under uncertainty, what the person at the back mentioned. And so of each of these, the one that I want you to always keep in mind is that probability as a degree of belief. This is a definition of probability that will help, will subsume all the other definitions of probability and will help you escape all the sort of weird conundrums, all the weird things about probability and sort of what it can and does not include. Um, in that way. So that definition that someone already gave us is that probability is a measure of the belief in a proposition given evidence. And I think this part is the most important part. Given evidence. 
And so that means it is a description of a state of knowledge. And this implication or this definition has several implications. Is the first one is that there is no such a thing as the probability of an event. Right? Because the probability or a probability depends on the evidence that you use to get to that probability. So you could have several people with, who will reach different probabilities for the same event because they will use different information or different evidence or account for that evidence in different ways. The second one, of course, because it's about belief, is that probability is inherently subjective. And again, this issue of evidence and information comes to play. It depends on what the believer has access to. So two people operating in the same world, if they don't see the same evidence, will have different kinds of probabilities. And this is sort of important when, when we're reading about real-world systems. And then I mentioned this one already. Different observers with different information will have different beliefs, this is obvious. So I just think if you always approach your career in machine learning now thinking with this approach of probability, it's not about counting frequencies of numbers, it's not about dealing with logic and extending logic from discrete cases to the continuum, but about the use of belief, then you'll always be in a way of thinking about probability as a tool which you can use and apply to almost everything that you're always doing. So there are some probabilistic quantities that we're just going to look at. I'm using this slide to introduce the notation we're going to use for those two for the three lectures. So of course, when I talk about probability, I'm going to use this notation. I'm going to write P of X, so the probability of an event X. I'm going to use bold symbols for vectors or multivariate quantity. Or sometimes write a star to say that this is the true, the true probability or some the probability of the real world which I want to know, which I'm trying to learn. And sometimes I may introduce an alternative probability, which I'll use the symbol Q. Um, then there are these two conditions of probability. These are, of course, the axioms of probability, that probabilities are greater than zero and that they sum to one or to integrate to one. And I'm just putting this point here is that maybe at the end of the two weeks, I hope that's the point. Um, at the end of your two weeks, continue with this definition of probability, but I hope some of you will come back to question this definition. There is no reason to believe that this definition of probability is the definition of probability. There are other probability theories we can create. There's no reason to think why should probability be numbers which are real numbers. They can be complex numbers. Why must probability sum to one in this way? They can sum to one or be normalized in other ways. And one of the only other probability theory that will come up when you question the absence of probability will be the quantum probability theory. And hopefully and there's a whole area of quantum machine learning um, that will appear when you when you critique this specific assumption, but I'm not going to do any of that uh, today. Bayes' rule is one of the most important ones. Bayes' rule is just simply the rule that helps you switch conditional probabilities. To move from the probability of random variable x can, can given a random variable z to the opposite or the inverse probability, the probability of z given x, we use Bayes' rule. So that's all Bayes' rule. Bayes' rule is the way of inverting probabilities. You know, that's all you should think about. It don't let base rule be anything more than that because then it becomes a scary kind of object with a lot of baggage that comes attached with it. Um, I will use this notation of parameterizing distribution. So this notation of P of Z given X is limited in some sense because it doesn't tell you how X is related to Z. It doesn't, conditioning doesn't tell you how the conditioning is happening. So I'll sometimes add this little theta either as a subscript or as a semicolon to let you know that there are some parameters theta which are affecting these probability distributions and Z is related to X using this set of, pro this set of parameters which will be theta. One of the most important things to read is expectation. So every time I use this symbol E, you should think of this integral. So you read this as the expectation of the function F <coughs> under the distribution P. And this is an integral of the function f under the distribution p. Now, what someone mentioned earlier is that you could use the measure theoretic um, definition of probability, and this definition will come up in that view. And sometimes this distribution p in that view will be called the measure, and we'll call f the function or its utility or various kinds of things. And even though the integral is nice, it's usually nicer to write the e notation, because in that case, we will see that this expectation is a linear operator. It is an operator that operates on functions. And this linear operator means we'll be able to manipulate things quite easily. We're going to have to do a lot of manipulations in the next lecture. And then the other quantity that's important is the gradient. The gradient of a function f with respect to the parameters theta is this set. And this is actually 
collection of all the partial derivatives of f with respect to all the elements of the vector of r. So this is sort of the notation that I'm going to use. I hope it's a little bit familiar to each of you, but if at any point the notation becomes unclear, please just ask me again. You can look at this slide again. But just remember, expectation is the most important one. And expectation of f is an integral of f under this distribution p. So now that we have all these probabilities, there are going to be four statistical operations that we are going to apply all of the probability to. The first one begins with the problem of collecting our data. This is what we can call data enumeration. No problem with machine learning does not begin without thinking about the data. For some of you that are thinking a bit more about social sciences, here you will think a lot about how it is you collect data, where the data comes from. So data enumeration becomes the first and almost the most core of those four statistical operations that is going to drive our lives as machine learners. The next sort of operation that comes from that is what we call summarization. Summarization is the process of taking all the data that you have and looking at the patterns. What is common between each and every of your data points? What is it that makes that data a data set and what are those trends that it has? The opposite of summarization is what we call comparison. Comparison involves taking your data apart, tearing it. Why is this data point different from all the others? And we need to be able to look at our data in this way. We need to be able to look at them in the ways that make them the same. And we also look, we need to look at our data in the ways that they are different from each other. So summarization and comparison are sort of two opposite sides of the same way of interrogating data. And then sort of the top of this hierarchy is the process of inference. When you hear the word inference, inference is the task of taking the data you collected with the model that you have designed and putting them together. This is how you plug data and model together. Whatever you do in that session is called this. So around these four kind of things, this sort of branch we call modeling usually, which is about how we describe our data. When we're thinking about data and the way things are different, we'll often be thinking about experimental design. We will often, which will be most of what you'll learn this week and the next week about, when you're dealing with inference through summarization, we're going to talk about estimation theory and about learning. And when we deal with comparisons and inference about comparisons, we will think about hypothesis testing. And throughout this week, I think you're going to look through the schedule, we're going to learn all of these um, to some extent, and I'm actually also going to talk about all of these over the next uh, two lectures. So these two, four statistical operations are going to be the basis of everything we're going to do. I'm going to just sort of do one um, aside. So let's first describe what it is to call a model or a probabilistic model. So what is a model? A model is just a description of the world, or a description of data, of a potential scenario which you haven't measured yet, but which could happen, or of some kind of process. That is a model. And a probabilistic model just writes that description using the language of probability, using those P of X's that I described, using those expectations, using any of those definitions of probability that we discussed in the beginning. So here's a simple example of a system that we may want to describe. And if we have this as a probabilistic model, then we can ask probabilistic questions about this model. What is the probability of a traffic jam? And when we write something like this, just probability of a quantity, I'll call that a marginal probability, because it doesn't depend on anything. It is just the object itself. So this word marginal probability will come up. We can ask questions about conditional probability, what is the probability of sirens given an accident? Or we can do this kind of inverse probability that we asked before. What is the probability that at a peak hour given that it is a traffic jam? So these are all the kinds of questions that probabilistic models help you answer. And conveniently, most models in machine learning, I can't think of any that aren't actually our probabilistic model. So even if they appear to you as if they are not probabilistic models, they are actually probabilistic models because we can write them out using the language of probability, sort of just where in that hierarchy of things you began. And so the key thing to remember is that probabilistic models let you learn probability distributions of data. And it might be sometimes difficult to think what it means to learn a probability distribution, but that's sort of one thing to think about. And because you're learning a distribution, distributions have many different kinds of characteristics. So distributions mean that you can make a choice about what about your distribution you would learn. And so you can learn the mean, just the sometimes called the central tendency, or just the 
points where you can learn that entire distribution has like lots of complexity here. Most of the work of machine learning is to sort of decide what about the distribution you want to learn, and once you've decided how much you want to learn, what it is that you can do to help you learn. Um, this is sort of a personal aside. I mentioned to you these four statistical operations that really bring together. And many of you will be thinking, at least in the back of your mind, or maybe in the front and home, the problem of artificial general intelligence and what it means for us to build really thinking and learning systems. And I think that these four statistical operations will be the most, with AI and artificial general intelligence, will give us the most refined instantiation of these four statistical operations because it will be an agent that will then need to do all of these kind of things in the most sophisticated and advanced way. And because inference is so central to this um, four operations, the core questions of AGI are going to be those four questions of statistical and probabilistic inference. And so that's why you'll find me spending a lot of my time in my own research and in these lectures talking about the questions of probabilistic inference and what it means to say that we can do an inference. Because once we can do inference, that means we can connect data and experience to models of the world and use those models to do actions in it. So let's begin with the model that you all know, which is linear regression. Um, linear regression is one of my favorite models because um, it always works, at least in some limited setting. So the basic linear regression model always begins as follows. It starts with this sort of linear combination. We have this linear predictor, which is called eta, and it's a linear combination of x, which is the data points in this case, with some parameters w. And how we're doing our probabilistic writing is that we say the probability of the data that we are observing, y, is described in this way. So probability of y given some transformation of this linear predictor using some parameters beta. Right. It is called linear because this is a linear function. And it's just important to sort of think of this as in this sort of building block diagram. That you took x, you formed this linear predictor, you put it through this function g, and then you get a prediction out. And in this linear prediction, and the classical linear prediction, all we are interested about this quantity y is its mean, which is why I'm writing the expectation of y. The expectation of y and the distribution of y is the mean. Right? And this basic linear operation can be any linear operation you can come up with. So here is the affine uh, operation, but it can be other kinds of linear operations, like the convolution. So I think you see sort of why I'm saying this. Right? And this function g is very important, especially in linear regressions and in the family of generalized linear regressions. And if you were thinking of your statistics classes, then you call this g function a link function or an inverse link function. Of course, in machine learning and in deep learning, we call this an activation function. And there are large families of activation functions depending on the kind of regression you want to build. If the data y was a binary outcome, then you would use one of these binary ones. You would use the logistic function, which would be a sigmoid um, activation or a sigmoid link function. Or you could use the probit, which is the Gaussian TDF. You could use the logistic or the tan h function, which is very popular in deep learning. But you could do other kinds of things as well. If you were counts, then you would build using an exponential function. I guess one that I like to always point out was that if the data y was some sparse outcome, from economics, we actually learned that you can create a sparse regression. And this link function is just a max of 0 and b. And that max function, what we often call in machine learning these days, is when it is rectified in your unit. So we already learned a lot of things, even in the basic linear regression setting, from many other fields of computational science. And I suppose the way you actually solve linear regression was that you created this object, the negative log argument, by creating the log of this probability distribution and doing the negative and then uh, following that descent. So this is sort of the basic building block of things. And you can extend this linear regression framework into a more generalized framework than this. So real world functions obviously look something more like this. So that linear function, which by its construction can only happen, uh, deal with data that is somehow linear in its structure, means that you will need something different. So, I sometimes call these recursive generalized linear models, but in machine learning, we would, we would call these deep networks. And what you would do is recursively compose those basic linear components that we saw in the previous slide. So you have the basic linear predictor. One of those is just linear regression. And if you stack 
a few of them together, you're obviously going to get a new kind of regression function, and that regression function will be called a particular network. <coughs> statistical, you can call it a uh, recursive generalizing new function, you can call it various other things like basis regressions, etc. And this is just literally the composition of these functions. Nothing changes about the way we did the learning. And I suppose the point of thinking about this more generalized regression in this setting is that we gain a very much more general, a much more flexible framework for building nonlinear and parametric models. And I think this is the key point that we do need to build more of this kind of data. And in the regime where we want to think about nonlinear models to deal with nonlinear data, and we want to deal with what I call parametric models, because there are a large number of parameters, those quantities W, or um, these what, I, what is in the P matrix here, those, these things are one of the most flexible models we have these days. And later in the afternoon, Rich is going to tell you about one other class of very flexible this is obviously not the only class of flexible models. But the rules of probabilistic thinking apply to any kind of models, not just deep models. So I want to just take a bit of a, a digression to talk about likelihood. So someone had mentioned earlier uh, about the likelihood of data, and so we're going to talk a little bit about this. So when we write a probabilistic model, we'll always write a probability of the quantity we are interested in given some other kind of data, side information. This is what a probabilistic model is, and if I write it in more detail, I even say that there may be some function h which transforms our data x. We use some additional parameters. This is a probabilistic model, and often we will call the log of this probability a likelihood function. And in this case, I'm also summing on many different data points yet. Now, a likelihood function is something very important. A likelihood function, we would never say the likelihood of data. That is technically incorrect to say. When we are having tea or out in the park with our friends or at the pub, we can talk about the likelihood of things, but in a technical setting, we can't say the likelihood of data. A likelihood is a function which describes the ability of parameters to explain the data. So likelihoods are functions of parameters, and which is why we use the likelihood as a way of optimizing parameters. So, Always make sure that if you are writing, that you write the likelihood of parameters, never the likelihood of data. You have to say the probability of data. This is sort of the way these two things. And this likelihood is very simple because it's the probability of y given x. And I can choose this likelihood. I can choose this distribution. Not all problems will be of this form. Some of them will actually be, have a likelihood that you won't be able to compute. Because the likelihood function may have an integral, in which case you'll call that an intractable likelihood. But whether it's tractable or not, every probabilistic model will have a likelihood. And part of the challenge to you is then to find that likelihood. And we're going to see in the next lecture many different tricks to find that likelihood and use that likelihood in different ways. So why are we interested in a likelihood? And I'm going to call these, I'm going to talk about prescribed likelihoods. And when I say a prescribed likelihood, it is the likelihood where I choose this distribution. So for example, P of y given x, if I choose that as a Gaussian, that is what I would call a prescribed likelihood because I made the choice that it's a Gaussian. And so there are many, many good reasons why you would be interested in um, using a likelihood or knowing the likelihood of um, your particular parameters and in your model. The first one comes from probability theory and, and statistical theory is because likelihoods give you efficient ways of building estimated of parameters. So what does that mean? An estimator of a parameter is the way you can learn to set the value of those parameters. Right? So they are statistically efficient, which means that you can build a way of learning those parameters, which will achieve, in the statistical sense, the criminal R level R. You will be able to learn those parameters in a way that, that no other way of learning will be able to match on the merit. So that's what that means. Um, they are asymptotically unbiased and consistent, which means as you see an infinite amount of data, you will converge to sort of the optimal parameter setting. And the best one, the other one is sort of maximum entropy, that in the absence of other kinds of knowledge, it will give you this principle of indifference, that in the beginning, all outcomes, all entities, all data points are equal. So this is sort of one of the most important ways. If you did not have an estimator that was statistically efficient, then you would spend all your time finding one that was efficient, because then you won't be learning correctly. The second one, which was what I mentioned around this element of hypothesis testing, was that 
we need to be able to build statistical tests that have good power. A power of a test is, is a technical concept, and the likelihood um, comes through the name of Pierce and Lemma, which will tell us that the likelihood ratio of tests is one of the best ways of determining whether a hypothesis uh, is valid. So this is sort of why likelihood comes into play. And if we can do those tests, then we can build smaller confidence regions around the estimates of those um, parameters eta that we have learned. Likelihoods mean that you can do many more things than you could do without them. So if you have data that's incompletely observed, it's somehow distorted, it is sampled with bias, actually you'll always have this case, then the likelihood is one where you'll be able to handle that and account for those sort of deficiencies of the data of the collection process. And in some cases, you can use the likelihood to offset these sort of deficiencies and correct those issues. And so this is another good reason. And then likelihood lets you pool information. You can combine different sources of data together, Knowledge that you have outside of your data set can be combined, for example, as a constraint or as a prior in some kind of form. Likelihoods, of course, also have their disadvantages. And the biggest problem with the likelihood is that you have what is called this misspecification. We have written a probability model, this P of Y given X, but that P of Y given X may not actually describe the data. No amount of data that we have will make this model work to actually describe our data. So, because if we have misspecified models, then we said the data is Gaussian, but it's far from a Gaussian, then we will get to this problem of inefficient estimates, we will have confidence inter intervals or tests will just fail completely, in which case that would have to be careful. And this is the problem that every, any part of machine learning will face. And one of the reasons why we spend so much time building new models and thinking about models and thinking about what is correct and how to evaluate. Um, I'll let me come to you again and see if um, we'll talk about the principle of the until we look at this. So we're just going to do a little bit of estimation theory just to recap or cap, depending. Um, so a probabilistic model again describes an outcome or data y using some probability distribution. And again, if I expand that, the probability of some observed data y, say this is a classification, y is 1 or 0, whether it's cats or dogs, h will be the regression function, x may be the images, and theta will be those parameters of the model that we're using. And let's consider this model that because of generalized model or this deep neural network that we are considering, and in this image, all the parameters live in this uh, theta. We just spoke about likelihoods and the centrality of likelihoods and why they are important. And we can write out the likelihood function, which is the likelihood function of our parameters, which gives us a way of describing the goodness of our parameters in relation to the data that we have observed. And the first sort of estimation principle that you all came across was called maximum likelihood, which just says take this likelihood because it's such a good way of describing the goodness of our parameters. Literally maximize that likelihood, and at the end we will get something that will describe the parameters that we want. And so likelihood and maximum likelihood is one of the most natural ways of trying to learn parameters. If I didn't tell you anything of this estimation theory, and I asked you, how would you have done that learning? You would have described something which would look like maximum likelihood. Um, but maximum likelihood has its problems. One of the problems with maximum likelihood is that it can be biased when you have limited amounts of data. The example that you all know is sort of estimating the variance of a Gaussian. When you estimate the variance of a Gaussian, you know there are two ways. The maximum likelihood estimator will tell you to do 1 over n, but the unbiased estimator will be 1 over n minus 1. Right, and that simple bias obviously disappears because n as n goes to infinity 1 doesn't matter, but that bias exists if you have a small amount of data. Bias in initial estimates of data means that you will be doing this sort of inefficiency of learning. And you can sort of see here, what this likelihood says is make this theta match this data y as best as it can. And because that's all it cares about doing, because all it cares about is building the strongest correlation between the parameters theta and the data that you observe, then you can easily get this problem of all this. But, um, you know, so that's sort of where we begin. And we can sort of extend that. So basically, if that is the final conclusion we've reached our maximum likelihood, then what we should do is sort of augment our probabilistic model in a different way. So what we'll do now is actually 
take a distribution and multiply this by a distribution over the parameters themselves. In this way, we will try and inject some other kind of knowledge about what we think those parameters should look like before we see any data. So we could say, well, I think roughly these parameters should look like a Gaussian. And this is the kind of thing that will force our data points to do more generalizing. So the likelihood function in this case looks much more general. It's sort of exactly what we had before. It is the standard maximum likelihood estimator. Now we add this additional term, which you all know as a regularizer. Mean. And a lot of estimation theory spends a lot of time thinking about what are regularizers, what make good regularizers, when is a regularizer a good and valid regularizer, and what's more. So we would often look at these kind of contour plots of different regularizers. The one we all use is a Gaussian one, and the Gaussian one just forces it to go back um, to zero, and you can do much stronger ones, the other one which is for sparse coding, or you can do stronger ones and other methods like spike and slab. And this estimation theory calls this maximum a posteriori, because we're going to take this function, and we're going to find the maximum of it. This is actually the posterior distribution given by Bayes' rule, and we're just going to find the maximum of this quantity. And so that gives us a, a good optimization objective. And now to come back to your question about the principle of indifference, um, if we had to choose P of theta as a uniform distribution, then we recover exactly the maximum likelihood estimate. And so this is what the principle of indifference means, is that if I don't know anything else, I choose as this prior probability distribution of the parameters theta as the uniform distribution. But that may not be the best thing to do, because we have other knowledge, or we need to be able to do more regularization on, on our parameters. Um, so you'll see this word shrinkage appear very often. And this, this sort of intuition is there that this regularizer asks you to shrink the parameters theta back to the value that you thought before you had any data. And so when you read in papers and statistical literature, you will look at shrinkage estimators and properties of shrinkage estimation and how you can shrink parameters back to their initial beliefs. And I will just say that even though I'm describing this in this probabilistic framework, not every regularizer you come up with can be written as a probability distribution. And so that's an interesting sort of thing to think about. If you want to have everything be probabilistic, then how it is that you can do that? Um, and I can tell you many examples of these kind of points. So again, just to summarize, regularization is essential to overcome the limitations of maximum likelihood estimation. And we have several other things. They will be called regularization. Sometimes you will see this called as penalization or penalized regression. In other kinds of literature, we'll talk about shrinkage and shrinkage estimates. And so all of these are different names for the same kind of idea. And then we have a wide range of regularization techniques. So the simplest one these days is just to get more data. You can think of data, and every data point is sort of a constraint that you add into your model. And every, the more constraints you have, the more you can learn, the more you can overfit. And so having large data is a, is a good one, but not every solution allows you to have large data set. Many people these days do input noise or jittering on the data, or what they call data augmentation. Again, this is an attempt to get a larger data set, but also it injects some kind of this prior knowledge of what data should look like and how they should behave. We spoke about Gaussians. Dropouts is another important one, which can be written as a probabilistic framework. And batch normalization, which is another one where populated early, so it can't be written as a, as a probabilistic regularizer in that way. So, um, map estimation sort of has several kinds of properties. And we're going to do a little exercise since I've been speaking for a while. So, the type of the solution that we have in map, map estimation is very, very interesting. So, this is an example of what will happen. And if you remember from before, I took the product of two things. I took a product of this likelihood, log probability times a prior on u here of theta. That product is a density, which means it's something like this. And I am maximizing the density. And maximizing the density is not necessarily something, because if you have a peak like this, that is the highest point of the density, but it's not the most probable point. Right? The reason we call it a density is because densities are something you must integrate. So when you read in papers, people talk about densities versus distributions. Densities are things you integrate to get a distribution. So if we want to take this density and get a distribution, we would integrate in regions around these points. And so if you did an integration, you'd find this point that has a big peak actually has very low probability 
Um, and so sort of this is a limitation of doing this kind of map estimation. That it's going to search for the thing that's maximum, but what is maximum is not necessarily typical. I hope that sort of yeah, fits right. This is typical in this data set. A good example is if you were doing some kind of uh, speech and voice modeling, then what would be maximum would be sort of a whisper. You would see it. You can generate data from the model and you'll hear this whisper. But that is not typical of speech data. Speaking is typical of speech data. And so we'll have to um, sort of keep that in mind. One of the things we didn't get out of our map estimation is sort of any way of representing uncertainty, which someone mentioned earlier was important about our definition of probability. But we can obviously do this. We can create confidence intervals. We can bootstrapping or similar techniques, cross validation. So um, this is sort of one thing we will have to do when we want to do estimation in this framework. Um, and one of the sort of problems that we have is that map estimation has a sensitivity to the parameterization that we use of the model. So the location of the map of this maximum point will actually change depending on how we choose to write on our model the lighting function that we actually have. So let's do a bit of an example together. I hope you all have some paper. We need to do a popular example together which comes from Kevin Murphy's textbook. And I'm going to remind you of this rule which is called the change of variables in probability. If I have a probability distribution mu and I want to change it into a different probability distribution by using some function, this is the way that I will change that probability distribution. So the example that we're going to do is we're going to look at this probabilistic model. The simplest one you can come up with, it says the probability that some variable y is equal one given parameter mu is obviously mu. So it's a binomial distribution. The probability of something being one is just a mean. And we're going to put a uniform distribution over this probability p of mu equals one. And so the question that I want you all to take two minutes doing is to compute the map estimate of this probabilistic model. We basically going to try and compute p of phi using this rule and then do this. So that half of the rule. If you can do parameterization one, so here's the function. I have function is mu, and I'm going to use phi squared as the parameter. So all of you on that, that are, use this sort of transformation, that leads to that rule, and try and compute the map estimate. And everyone on this side, sort of use the second parameterization, or use this function as a different parameterization of that one. And sort of turn away, and let's see what you come up with. Is one, and so the map of this quantity is phi is one, 
But in the other one, the map is completely different. It's the exact opposite, it's zero. So hopefully, uh, as we're scrubbing, you'll reach this conclusion. So now the question is obviously, why should I care about this? Does it really matter that the parameterization is different? And is it going to matter to us in practice? And the question is maybe here. And I think the reason is just to make us aware that these are some of the issues which live in the kind of estimation theory that we have. There is obviously a sensitivity which has our map estimate has. In one solution, we had zero, and the other solution, we had one. They were completely different solutions. And even if you try to map phi back to mu, the answer was completely different. Now, is this the kind of model that you want? Right? A, what's happening is that the model has now become sensitive to the units of the data that we're working in and the way that we're doing things. And typically, you know, if you remember from your older physics classes, you don't want to be sensitive to units. Units are sort of a bad kind of thing to be sensitive to. What many people will do these days is they, they will offer an explanation or an interpretability of our models using those parameters. Now, one has to ask the question that if you can get two entirely different sets of parameters for the same, same model and the same um, estimation principle, what is it to look at those kind of interpretations that we give, whether you are plotting parameters, looking at the gradients with respect to those parameters, etc. So there's something just to keep in mind there. And then, obviously, because the estimate, the max is different, the gradients are different, the path to which we compute that gradient is going to be different. In some cases, we can create settings that will have unstable learning, and then this is just something which affects the design problem. So let's just always keep in mind, but the point of just showing you this is that many people have been thinking about this, and in this part of estimation theory, we'll end up in this area which we call the invariant map estimation. And then the invariant map estimators look to create a probability model that are slightly different. That instead of just p of theta, I'm going to multiply by some other quantity. This quantity here is the Fisher information. And the Fisher information is one of those central quantities of information theory and um, algebraic information theory, which helps you remove dependencies on units. If you have a big goofy thing, what the Fisher information does is that it tries to make everything like a beautiful bowl. And the bowl is sort of one of those perfect things for optimization. And so the reason to connect here is that when, you, when we start thinking about these invariant estimators, then we get connected to other kinds of topics like natural gradients and why natural gradients become important when we do learning, and then also to trust region optimization and various other kinds of optimization. And if you were in probability theory, then we will talk about things which are related to uninformative priors and other ways of designing prior distribution of Bayesian analysis. So anyway, we've looked at map estimation, we've looked at maximum likelihood, they all have their problem. But none of these problems, they are issues which are coming up with this issue of sensitivity, the issue of overfitting, issue of confidence estimation, and none of them have really addressed, addressed them, even though we uh, have tried. So one of the ways of addressing those solutions is to use what is called a Bayesian analysis. And a Bayesian analysis asks you to take this probability thinking to sort of its logical limit or extent. And so now, instead of just reasoning about this most likely solution, which we were doing in all the previous things, we're going to try and reason about this entire probability distribution. And reasoning about the entire probability distribution means that we will maintain information about its underlying variability, its uncertainty, and we can use that knowledge to sort of help regularize it other ways. So, this is what we're going to do. We're going to learn more than the mean, and learning more than the mean is effectively the core of what is called the nation philosophy. We're going to always use this quantity, probability of y given h with some parameters theta. We're going to put some distribution over those parameters theta, and we're going to try using Bayes' rule, using that rule for inverted probability, to learn p of theta given y. And this, though, is going to be one of the most difficult things you will encounter. It looks very benign, but so this is what we're going to spend most of our time thinking about. And in general, I'm just going to advocate that all of us take a pragmatic Bayesian approach for probabilistic reasoning in deep learning in particular, but in all of machine learning. We need to decide when we can be Bayesian and when we can't be Bayesian, depending on various trade-offs around computation, around the task, or how important it is to uh, quantify uncertainty, report confidence intervals, have um, efficient reasoning over data. And so, what a pragmatic Bayesian, as I hope all of you will become, will be is that you will reason.
reason over some parts of the data using full probability distribution, and in other parts you will just use the mode and be happy with that. And that's sort of what I'll show in part two. So let's talk a little bit about Bayesian analysis. We are, again, when we do Bayesian analysis, there will be two important quantities that will come up. There will be the quantity which we'll call the evidence. And the evidence is sort of uh, this integral. It says, take P of Y given H of X and remove the influence that the prior probability, the distribution of the parameters have. This is the evidence that we have of Y given data X without any other influence. This is the most important integral in all the computational science. If you just remember this integral, um, that would be very important. So, and then related to this integral is to compute what is called the posterior distribution. What is the distribution of P of theta given Y comma X? These two things are tightly coupled and related to each other. And almost all of Bayesian analysis and much of modern machine learning is ways of approximating these quantities, finding ways of us competing them. And so in Bayesian analysis, anything that is not observed must be integrated out. So this is the key thing you must know about what it means to be a Bayesian. If when we write a probabilistic model, P of Y given H of X with parameters theta, the parameters theta are not the thing we measure. The parameters theta are unobserved. And by the principles of Bayesian analysis, things which are not observed must be integrated, which is why we get this integral, which is the evidence. Right? But again, the evidence is something difficult to compute, and that's why in Bayesian analysis, unlike in the other estimation theories, integration becomes the central mathematical operation of the So you're going to see this expression, intractable integral, it will appear everywhere. The first time, and for several years, actually, I never knew what it meant when someone said intractable integral. All I knew was this, it's difficult. Um, so you're going to see this phrasing in a lot of places. And what that means is it's just that we're not going to know this integral in close form. And for many integrals, we will know it. And actually, even sometimes when we do know it in close form, the integral is so high dimensional that we won't actually want to use that kind of solution. So usually, that's what it means. It's either we don't know the integral in close form, or it's a very high dimensional integral means that solving it using techniques like quadrature, for example, are not possible. I think there's an important point is that theta here is a multivariate quantity. So even though I'm writing one integral, these are actually d integrals which are the dimension of t. They are d integrals for every parameter theta. And I'm just going to hide all those multiple integrals on the one side. So another bit of terminology that you can see, in machine learning, we make a distinction between two types of data. We make a distinction between what is called inference, on one hand, and a distinction between something else we call learning. So now that you know a little bit about this pragmatic Bayesian philosophy, when we say inference, inference is about reasoning about unknown probability distributions. So when someone, typically machine learning, says that to me inference, this is what they mean. They're going to learn, learn the probability distribution. And when they say learning, or in its full formal term, parameter learning, they're just going to do optimization. They're just going to learn a single value for that thing by the result of optimization. And you'll see this quite often, and it gets kind of messy and confusing, but if you keep that sort of distinction in mind, that will help you navigate older and newer things. But so in other areas, we'll see this wording used completely differently. So in statistics, there will be no such distinction. In statistics, there's only inference, or more generally, there's only estimation. And so when you read papers in statistics or in probability theory, then you don't have to keep in mind that this is the map that you're going to use. In Bayesian statistics, there's only inference because in Bayesian statistics, you'll only be learning probability distribution. You never do this halfway kind of thing. And so when Bayesians won't have to talk about learning, they will only talk about inference because they want to learn always full probability distributions. Um, if you've been using TensorFlow or Fignano or Keras and these kind of tools, you will see this word inference appearing in the documentation. In software engineering, inference is simply just the evaluation of a function. This is technically not a good use of the word, so you should eliminate this use of that word from your minds immediately. But know when you read the documentation, that is what they mean, that I have this function here, y given s, and evaluating that function as a set of parameters is what they will call inference. And in general, if you are reading in more general cognitive science, AI, philosophy of science, philosophy of machine learning, there will be the concept of learning. Of course, it's one of the most important things of being a human. And learning is just that general process of acting based on past experience. So it gets a bit difficult.
folks, you will have to navigate the business sort of part of the one of your journey to machine learning to make sense of this mess. Um, so there are basically two streams of machine learning, which I think are the biggest streams today. You have one hand, which is deep learning, which I've been talking a lot about. And deep learning is really great. As I said in the beginning, we have a framework for rich non-linear models for classification, sequence prediction, anything you can think about that's what you can do with deep learning using that sort of recursive general data linear model framework we're thinking. We can build them with very scalable models. We have you have one billion data points, one billion data points, if you think you need to have 10 years of the experience of a single human in a amount of data to learn, we can learn that using deep learning, using stochastic optimization. It's conceptually very simple because you're just stacking these layers together. And because its central operation is to work with gradients, it's very easy to compose with any other kind of gradient-based learning mechanism that you might have. Of course, it has its disadvantages. We spoke about the limitations of map estimation, and maximum and likelihood, and learning point estimates, where things that are maximum are not typical. We find it hard to score these models. What is the best model? How do you choose amongst a competing set of models when you only have a single estimate? How do you penalize the complexity of your models in interesting ways when you just can't collect more and more data? Because um, that's not always going to be possible. On the other hand, we're going to have this framework of Bayesian reasoning, which I mentioned, and I asked you all to become pragmatic Bayesians. Most Bayesian methods that you're reading in textbooks are simple models. They exist in these what are called conjugate or linear models. These are models where you can do all those integrals in closed form. They are not intractable in what you'll find in your textbooks. And even when they are more interesting, then you have this intractable inference or intractable integral, which means that it's computationally expensive to do. You have very long simulation times, and all these things come together. But Bayesian reasoning gives a single framework for both model building, for inference, which we've been talking about for prediction, and for decision making. These are the four tasks that we actually want to do. We can easily account for uncertainty, variability of outcomes, and then we are robust in some sense to overfitting. Bayesian reasoning is not immune to overfitting, but we are much more robust to overfitting. And you have the tools for model selection and composition. So, of course, the reason I show you this slide is that what is, red, what is blue in one is red in the other, so it's natural to combine these two things. And so this era of Bayesian deep learning is one of the active, very busy fields um, right now because it's so natural and you can do so much when we combine them. So there are sort of uh, three different areas I want to look at. The first one is Bayesian regression, and Rich, come, Rich will give you much more about Bayesian regression. But the Bayesian regression asks you to break this thinking to build probabilistic models over functions directly. So here's our probabilistic model. We'll put a prior probability on parameters beta, which in this case is simple Gaussian. If we have an observation model, we can say that we can assign a probability, a probability of data, and observe logical function in this case to y, given data x, which will be a categorical <coughs> distribution. And that categorical distribution will have parameters pi, and this parameters pi given some function of x and theta. And the key task for Bayesian regression is to build this posterior distribution of theta. Now the function is represented through these parameters theta. So this is the picture you will see very often um, as a sort of good way of conceptually thinking about it. You have input data x. All these lines are the parameters theta here, and they all have probability distributions. Rather than single points, you have to learn distributions for all of them. And that's what a Bayesian regression means. And because these parameters define a function, and we have a distribution over those parameters, we effectively have a distribution of functions in this case. And there are many ways of building distributions of functions um, and maintaining uncertainty over those functions. In deep learning, Doing this kind of Bayesian regression is actually very hard to do. Because in typical deep models, there aren't 50 parameters. There are more like 5 million parameters or 50 million parameters. And so maintaining probability distributions, these P of theta given Y of 50 million parameters will be a very difficult thing to do. And one of those research questions that is sort of at the forefront right now. And there are many ways of learning posterior distributions. And when we come to part three, we're going to talk about this problem of learning posterior the second kind of core problem is unsupervised learning. So moving from the supervised learning regression problems to unsupervised learning and what we call density estimation. Density estimation is the problem of learning the density of the data. How can we know this probability distribution of the data? We've done 
done this if you already use common density estimation and other, other kinds of approaches. And um, so what are the ways that we can do that? And we're going to talk a lot more about deep generative models and in general about unsupervised learning in part three. Um, but for now, the classical density estimation model that you all know is either factor analysis or PCA, which is a linear version of building a density model on data. And we're going to come back in the later parts to build far more non-linear um, and deeper versions of this kind of model that have more complexity and require a much more uh, deeper set of tools. The final sort of area is around decision making and many sort of problems in all computational sciences have this kind of structure where you have an external environment, a measurement system, um, an agent operating environment, humans in an experimental setup, sort of um, operations are happening in the financial market, and you can take observations, sensations, or measurements from that environment, and then you have a decision maker which needs to take some sort of action. So you see this in all experimental design, all areas of causal learning and causal inference, reinforcement learning is a classical one, control theory, utility theory, where you have this sort of loop. And what we want to do in that setting is we can build a similar probabilistic model. Here are probabilistic model over actions or experiments over designs, as always. Then we're going to build a probabilistic distribution over this environment of model. There are several things we can do. We can actually build this as a model, or we can assume it's not a model that we don't want to learn. And then there's going to be a utility or a reward, which is going to be the equivalent of our life of the function. And using these three things, we can be able to describe sort of all of the reinforcement learning, or at least some part of the reinforcement learning, using these tools of probability, and we're going to also look at that in the last part. Um, just to connect to some things you're going to see later on in the week, there are several dualities that you're going to see between models, which come in and which are very obvious when you use the language of probability. So we have been talking about deep network, building rich generalized regressions, and the other way of explaining these kind of recursive regressions and deep networks is using this language of basis function regression. So what we do instead, we just say that we only have a linear function over some basis functions phi. And what we're doing in deep learning is that we're parameterizing the basis functions phi using a learnable set of models, and then we try and learn this whole thing together. Now, if you use this basis function regression approach, and you try to expand what it means to learn these functions in a quadratic case, you'll be able to move from what are these primal variables, which I'm going to call Ws, to a set of dual variables instead. And these dual variables are going to be, um, you, I, you don't see them here, but they relate to sort of these probabilities. And this is sort of where the kernel trick is going to come into play. When you see Arthur in a few days' time, Arthur will tell you more about the kernel trick and about how you can build functions and regressions of a function, the probability distributions of a function, where the functions are parameterized by parameters W, to directly building objects over the functions themselves. And then we're going to read all this theory from Hilbert spaces, and we're going to use that in that sense. And then when we try and be Bayesian around this kind of functional analysis, functional point of view, that's when we're going to come to build the probability distributions of a function, which is what um, Rich is going to tell you later. And whichever one you start from, you can go back to any other one because there is a simple one-directional mapping that takes you back. And in fact, by doing both of the analysis in both settings, that is when you actually gain a great deal of insight. And in fact, one of the most, in many recent papers are sort of exploring these dualities between different models to try and explain why is it that deep learning works, how it is that they relate to their prior distribution, what kind of functions are they capturing, what kind of functions can they not capture. And so when you see through the rest of the week, um, both Arthur and Rich will tell you about these other elements of these dualities that we should actually try and put together. And so the final bit is to talk a bit about what it means to say something is deep and hierarchical. So a, bit, a hierarchical model is just something that decomposes a probability distribution according to the rule, conditional probability rule. So it looks like this, if I have a prior probability of Z, I can decompose this, and Z here is a collection of Z1, Z2, Z3, sorry. Um, you can always build in this sequence of conditional distributions. P of Z1 given Z2, Z2 given Z3, and so on and so forth. And in this way, you can build some of the richest models that we have here. And in fact, this is the way of building richness and complexity in a model. In the very beginning of this lecture, I told you about building those recursive compositions, and that recursive principle is captured in this idea of hierarchical learning. And so we're going to talk about
about these sort of deep directed journalism modeling later on, but some of you would have studied already hierarchical mixtures of experts or these information bottlenecks. So how you build the hierarchy is sort of the key question. Because we are learning distributions, distributions have at least a mean, and then they have some other kind of things like the variance, the scheme, the cryptos, other kinds of higher moments. When you build a hierarchy of means, a mean at one level is dependent on a mean at another level, is dependent on a mean at another level, that is sort of why the word deep means. Deep sort of is very deeply coupled. <laughs> deep is coupled with the idea of building hierarchical models of means of distribution. So if you were to write this thing out and make said to, to, said to here dependent on the mean of this, that will give you a deep model. But if you build a hierarchy of means and variances, then you will enter a much more general area of hierarchical learning, which is study very uh, deeply in vision analysis. So back to these foundations that I wanted to talk about. How is it that you are going to approach your machine learning research and your machine learning practice using all the rules of probabilistic thinking that we spoke about? So in general, um, you should always think about building a human-centered, interdisciplinary approach to your research. So someone asked earlier about the connection to neuroscience. And one of the sort of more, you know, more current ways of thinking about this in cognitive science in general is the one that I like the most, I call this Sun's phenomenological level. And the phenomenological level asks you to think about what it is to build a model and to build a learning system in all the ways that it will affect us as people in general. So we're going to think about physiological ways, what is the computation, where is the computation happening? Is there computation in the brain? Is it in the GPU? Is it some other kind of custom accelerator? Is it distributed over a cloud? Is it in some kind of HPC system? Then we have this sort of componential view, which is sort of many of the things that we are talking about. What are those core ingredients of cognition that we have? What is it that we want to do? Planning, explanation, uncertainty, causality. Then we have these sort of psychological things which come together. Um, actually, what I just described is the psychological, there's complementary more, there's probability rules, Bayesian analysis, etc. And finally, the reason I like Sun's uh, levels is that it allows us to think about the sociological levels. How is it that different systems interact with other kind of learning systems? How is it that they interact with humans? How humans interact with those systems and so this is sort of what will be more and more important, especially if you want to know responsible human-centered machine learning AI. But for your machine learning core, I of course have asked you um, to think about a probabilistic and pragmatic approach. And there are two ways you are going to encounter your machine learning practice. One of them is sort of a framework which is going to be called the architecture loss framework. If you are already coming up some things in deep learning, um, you've already been using this framework where you build an architecture which takes data in, then you build a loss function, you optimize this loss function. Um, this is a very good view, and I'm going to ask you to also think of one other view, which I call the model inference and algorithm view. And this view, I think, is central to everything we do about machine learning. And if you can keep this view in mind, then you will be able to understand sort of how many different areas of machine learning itself are connected to each other, but more importantly, how things that we do in machine learning are connected to all the other areas of computational science that exist, whether it's social science, whether it's computational cognitive science, whether it's econometrics and economics, whether it's utility theory or information theory or statistical physics. All of these things are our field of study, which is why it's so interesting to be in machine learning, but we need the tools to be able to understand and read in those fields. And the model inference algorithm paradigm will give you one way of reading it. So the architecture loss framework, of course, asks you to build a computational graph. And the computational graph is going to be literally the sequence of operations that you need to chain together to go from input x to an output y. And you can do this for everything in all those three areas of learning that we spoke about, whether it was supervised learning, whether it was unsupervised learning, or whether it was reinforcement learning and decision making. So this is generally what we do. And then to that, we build on those computational graphs a system of error propagation. And deep learning is one way of building computational graphs and doing bad propagation, but we have other ways of doing this in machine learning. The other popular one is called message passing, where we build a stochastic computational graph and then we do the error propagation by propagating messages distributed back through the system. The one that I wanted to talk about, again, was this model and this algorithm. So every machine learning system can be broken up into these three components. There is the model, a probabilistic model, which is what we spoke about, which describes the world. 
there is a learning principle or a principle of inference, and for any model and for any inference that you combine, you will then be able to build an algorithm. So an algorithm is the unification of a model and an inference principle. So if we talk a little bit about models, um, we have many, many different models, and over the next few weeks, you're going to get a crash course in all models under the sun that we've ever created um, in machine learning. So we have the directed and undirected models. I'm not going to talk about the undirected models, and I actually think maybe this is going to be one of the weaknesses of your two weeks. No one is going to talk about undirected models. Maybe I'll put a little bit. Um, then you have the fully observed versus partially observed or latent variable models. And we're going to talk a lot about partially observed and fully observed models. And then you have the models which are parametric, non-parametric, and semi-parametric, which you'll also see a bit about. So all of these are compatible with each other. They are not mutually distinct kind of models. But we sort of do need to know the kind of axes of variation, because they are the way that we can think about what is good about some model, and what's good and why a certain model will work in our particular problem. So when it comes to learning principles, as I said, a principle of inference is the way you connect the data that you have to the model that you have chosen. So all of this is going to fall under the banner of statistical inference. And when I you know, teach other people in other courses or my colleagues at DeepMind, I always ask them to think about two ways of doing inference. One is for a direct inference, and other ways are indirect inferences. And we're going to talk a lot about both direct and indirect inferences over the next two lectures. Direct inferences are most of the things you would have learned already in your other classes, um, where you would have studied. They are what we spoke already, maximum likelihood and maximum inferiority. Um, we're going to talk a bit later about variational inference and expectation maximization. But we have many other things like class approximation, integrated method with class approximation, and then I think later in the week you'll see a bit more about Marcus Chamberlain's column method. So these are all the direct inference methods. And the reason they are called direct inference methods is that they try to directly target the likelihood function. This quantity P of X that I wrote to you, which is a way of describing how your model and parameters interact with your data, you directly try and compute P of X and use P of X as the way of learning. In indirect inferences, you don't try and learn P of X directly. You find, try to find some roundabout way of learning P of X. And we're going to talk a lot about that, but there are many, many different ways. We have two sample comparison and two sample testing, which we learn from hypothesis testing. Method of robots, which I'm also going to talk about a bit. Approximate Bayesian computation, I won't do. Transportation methods are becoming much more uh, important. And Arthur will talk to you a little bit about maximum mean discrepancy. So we have sort of this whole framework, and maybe in a few years' time, or maybe some of you will add to this sort of um, landscape of different inferential principles that we have available and to help us understand how it is that we choose an inferential principle. As I said, you have choices over models, and now you have hundreds of thousands of choices of learning principles, and you have to put these two things together. And as I said, any given model and any given learning principle can themselves be put together in any different way. So for example, if you're building a convolutional neural network, you could implement that as a model, and its inferential principle will be this penalized uh, maximum likelihood, and you could then implement that in an algorithm in many different ways. The choice of optimization that you use will give you a different algorithm. The choice of regularizing that you use will give you a different algorithm. And if we use things in the model inference algorithm framework, then we can think about ways of fairly comparing different models. If you just compare two algorithms, that is not enough of a fair comparison. Because what is the thing that you need to keep? You either need to keep the model fixed and change the inference so that you can make statements about the effectiveness of your inference given those, all those choices. But you fix the inference and you make changes in the model to then say, well, these models are better than the data that I have or not. And then on top of that, there are sort of studies about why do certain algorithms work. So the model inference algorithm framework helps us do better, more rigorous structured comparisons in science. Another example, which I don't know if you'll see later in the week, it's about restrictive balls machines. And again, we do maximum likelihood learning. And there are many, many ways of doing learning in this framework. Contrastive divergence is the most famous one. There are variations of that, persistent contrastive divergence, parallel tempering that we can do in market chains, uh, natural gradient methods as well. The one we are going to talk about uh, later on is about latent variable models and then choosing variational inference in those latent variable models. They can themselves be implemented in various different algorithms. The variation of PM algorithm is one way. Using expectation propagation is another way. There are other 
approximate message passing method, variational auto encoders, and one other algorithm for learning the latent verbal ones. That's very true. In terms of the final one, which we'll also talk about later on in more details about <coughs> two implicit generative models and two sample testing as those model and inference. And then how is it that you build an algorithm out of that? You can do that in many different ways. Some ways that more unsupervised and supervised learning. You can use approximate variation computation as one way, generative back cell networks are the famous uh, example of uh, an algorithm in this case. So let me end up on what I asked you in the beginning to use the dinosaur to think about formalistic descriptions of systems and data and to use that as sort of the principle which guides you through the way you approach machine learning to analyze the data and build those problems that will use machine learning in the real world. And then we looked at many different ways of foundations of machine learning, looking at deep learning, an estimation theory, a hierarchical models, and those dualities between different ways of thinking. And then finally we came to this model instance algorithm paradigm, which I think should be the core of your thinking. If you approach everything by making sure you are clear as to what the model, what the inference, and what the algorithm is, then you'll be able to stitch things, steal things, combine them in different ways, and build new and interesting algorithms and models. Um, and so that's the end of the first bit. Is there other any questions? Yes.
so there's a question. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, so okay, the question is about calibrating probability. So when we learn a probability distribution, we may have some kind of errors in the probability distribution that we learn. So what that means is that, for example, I may have learned the probability distribution of CAF in the data set is 0.8, but in reality, when you look at the data, the actual probability is 0.6. So this is a mismatch of the probability we learned versus watching the data, and so there's a whole area of calibration where we'll try and adjust the model after the fact or even during the learning to try and do this calibration. So the question is, why are we not doing as much of that calibration in machine learning? So for example, it's true, if you are going to do image classification, people most often don't do this calibration, but in other areas, this is the only thing people do. When you see later in the week when Suji comes to speak, about healthcare, she will go at length to talk about the ways that we do calibrated probability learning in, um, in healthcare settings by using counterfactual models, by building richer kind of probability models and density estimates, and combining generative models and discriminative models in those ways. So I think there is a lot of work to do, and actually calibration is sort of one of the most interesting questions that we have right now, because in the scale of very large models, we don't actually have very good ways of building confidence intervals and calibration itself. Any other questions from this side, maybe? One of the ladies in the room, a question for us, the feedback. Okay, anyway, thank you very much for being so attentive.